All right, welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? I'm good, Nathan. How about you? I'm doing fantastic, and it looks like we have a very special surprise for the listeners today. We do. Um, Let's start out with a couple of questions we're going to address on the show. Two questions. First, how do you market your business when you have a highly specialized business almost no one has ever heard about before, not just your business, but the kind of work you do. And secondly, how do you use copy in that kind of business when you're not a copywriter yourself and you've never been able to find a copywriter who knows how to communicate what you do? Our guest today, Rick Harmon, will help us get answers to both questions. And this information will be very useful to any business owner who writes copy, and lots of valuable tips for most copywriters too. Rick's specialty, in a nutshell, is to make loans that help people straighten out messes with inherited property. You know, probate lawyers have a saying, where there's a will, there's a way. But when there's no way in sight, Rick Harmon will find a way. Actually, they don't have that saying at all. I just made it up for this show, but they should because that's what Rick does. He straightens out probate messes that nobody else can straighten out. And now that sounds like a great service, but as long as it's a business, you still need to get clients. And that's where Rick's unusual story comes in. But first, this comes in. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. Most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So, Rick, welcome. This is a long time coming. <laughs> Uh, good to be here. Thanks for having me on, David. Ah, you're welcome. Thanks for being here. So, um, before we jump into all of the copywriting and marketing nuggets that I know you're going to give our listeners, could you give us a, a little flash slice of life story that can give us some idea of how upside down and inside out and down the rabbit hole things can go in your business? Sure. Uh, I've been at this a long time. And in the course of this, get a lot of calls that you have no idea where they're going to go. And so uh, I'm just going to offer an example. In my early days, and, and I, I started real estate as an investor in the late 70s. I'm, I'm older than people think. People look at me and they say, nah, you look pretty old. Um, and I, I found that there is a number of fact patterns that come across, you know, but they can really get lost in them. So I'm going to give you a story when I was still in the business of occasionally acting as a person in charge uh, of an estate where uh, I would exchange equity, basically a piece, uh, uh, a piece of the transaction, a piece of the estate uh, in exchange for being the person in charge, in this case, an administrator. So here's the facts. I had a case where, uh, a man well into his 70s was doing some electrical repair work in the attic of his house. It caused a fire and he perished in the fire. And I got involved in the case only to discover that he only had one son who he barely knew who happened to be in prison. And I mean, the story has all these crazy fact patterns. I don't want people to get lost in the facts, but the craziness was it starts with a scuffle over who's going to be the administrator of the estate. A baby mama. Now, by the way, this this man was in his fifties. The the uh, the son, and the 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 mother comes out of nowhere, purporting to have been married. The other fact patterns include a scuffle and lawsuit over the value of the property. Code enforcement. There was a pending bulldozer with the city because the city attorney and code enforcement wanted to scrape the property. Is about to go to tax sale. I can compound this thing on and on and on. Many years ago, there was a little cartoon of a mouse caught in a mouse trap and people lining up behind it. And, and, and this is kind of what I, I discovered is that <clears throat> I got tired of being having these duties. They're called fiduciary duties. 
and having to do that and uh, for for no appreciation or real real value. So that was an, an, ex, an experience that I had to say, hey, look, there is just a crazy number of things that have happened. I'd seen many of the things that happened, and there were, there were more things that I won't go into. But I discovered there there were so many things that could potentially happen. It was an endless and evergreen source of problems. And that's why I've been doing this for, for so long, because the attorneys need someone who is not an attorney. But in my case, I insist on being treated as a peer and as a non-attorney or what the attorney referred to as a lay person. And I'm basically a lender with a specialty. I'm a private money equity lender. And I've crafted this, uh, the, these, the, these products to work with these attorneys for many, many years. Most of my business comes from marketing to, to the attorney. So that they understand uh, that I, I get their world. Yeah, know but that, with yeah. that situation, did you straighten it out or did it end up like a, you know, the, the city ended up raising the property and everything went to hell or did, what was the conclusion? Well, the conclusion were, were there's multiple lawsuits and what have you. Uh, part of the term that, that, I, that I like to think of uh, starts with cluster. Yeah, and, clusterfuck. So what, what, what was the bottom line? How did it end? Uh, ultimately... Uh, sold the property, uh, li okay. liquidated the estate. That, that's what the, the, the legal term and, is. And, and so, divided up the um, proceeds accordingly? Yeah, yeah, some way, yeah. Okay. There, there, there was a resolution and uh, everybody, you know, walked away with some, some money and, and someone else owns the property. Good. So, you know, uh, one of the things, I, and I'm I'm just inferring this from what you've just said, is that the business you do can get messy and wild enough just by itself when, when all the people are, uh, you know, fairly willing to be cooperative and, and have a threat of being reasonable. Uh, you don't want everybody, right? You don't want everybody. And our mutual friend, the great sales trainer, John Paul Mandocha said something uh, you told me you found incredibly useful in your marketing. All sales is a process of, disqualification yeah uh what does that look JP like in real life I, yeah J, jp and i are friends and yeah. I, I met him through perry marshall uh and i was in perry marshall's uh, uh mastermind group for uh for for some time uh a while back uh, a very you know mastermind groups not to get off on that topic no no don't here. stay stay on the topic and and the the uh the disqualification point i was well aware of it and I started applying it on my copywriting to make clear. And because basically the intent is to disqualify people early. And how do you do that? Well, I do it one of several ways. First of all, I try to attract the right people and I try to repel the wrong people. Mm -hmm. And, and the, it's compounded when, I'm, when you're a business owner or, or, or running a business and having a copywriter write for you, where you're writing both for someone who is a referral source, as in my case, most of my business comes to me through referrals, but I also have to be able to write at the level that the end user, uh, call it consumer or whoever, um, is going to understand. The, so, the end user being the person who is dealing with a tangled up inherited property, right? Yeah, let, let's say executor, administrator, trustee. Yeah, so, so what are some of the words you say to repel the wrong people? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I'll start with the attorney. Uh, I'll start with the attorney who I don't have a relationship with, and I will use terms to repel the ones who are shopping around. And, and you, what, what words do you use? How do you do this? Uh, I'll use terms like uh, uh, suggesting if they are a uh, personal shopper for their client, don't call me. Okay. It's quite correct. Yeah. And, yeah. and in terms of repelling the clients that you don't want, what are some of the terms that you use? Um, one of my favorite, uh, entitled millennial. <laughs> you, you don't take entitled millennials? Um, Rick, if you're going to say things like me. that on this podcast, I'm going to ask you to issue a trigger warning before you say it. <laughs> no, the, the, issue, the issue is this, is that I'm looking for people who have 
and end users who have a particular types types of problems. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for people who have well, you know, and, and so I, I want to be very, very specific. So when I use that term, apparently that's like dropping f bombs on this show. Um, that we prefer f bombs to words like entire. I'm not even going to say it again. <laughs> so uh, the 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 intent the intent though it, are is to use is to use language so the people understand. I'm not particularly looking for a fact uh, scenario that is a, uh, unless there are pain points, sig significant pain points. So and, in other words, you, you don't want to hold their hands and coddle them. You want to find people who have problems and are willing to have you help them solve the problems. Is that the, the gist? Yeah, of absolutely. And, and if somebody comes to me early in the process before an attorney is involved, I want to make it very clear. I mean. You know, I do have control issues, uh, which which I think is I think is wise. If you're if you're a business owner, if you don't have some some type of control issues, you're going to have money issues. Mm -hmm. So, the the thing I try to do is I try to attract people who have the uh, the, the pain points, both the attorneys and, and particularly the attorneys' clients that have a number of these fact patterns. And these fact patterns tend to tend to be into a number of um, I. Well, I'll explain it this way. What I did some time ago, uh, Perry Marshall has something called the Swiss Army Knife. And, uh, and he has a little course, it's very affordable if you're a copywriter and you want to do that. And then it's a way of, of taking your avatar and that's your target end user or your target uh, referral source and breaking down the things that they care about, they don't care about, what their fears, et cetera, are. It gives you a matrix, in a sense, of these things to work with. What I then did is, for my purposes for copywriting is I created a 12 month matrix, make it real, real simple. Every month has a particular, you know, type of a, a theme. So it might be, as an example, might be themes related to time, creditors, foreclosure, disputes, et cetera. And then I can build on that and I've been able to create a really simple system for myself in part because I've never, I've yet to find a copywriter who would ever be able to get my voice and gets, gets and lost. So are you writing, writing about on. these things each month? Are you like sending out a newsletter or putting something up? Yeah. On the yeah. Yeah. Actually a paper print newsletter. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I, I sort of want to talk about that in terms of um, a, a larger question, which I, I think you're brilliant at. Um, just, and you know, I know you through uh, the Carlton mastermind and, We've had some um, offline or outside of mastermind, off campus, that would be a good word, off campus <laughs> chats. Yes. Um, but um, uh, I, I want to actually start, you're, you, you seem to have traffic some, somewhat with people in Hollywood. And I saw a quote from a Hollywood film composer named Bear McCrary, and he wrote scores for many shows and films, including Battlestar Galactica, Walking Dead, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. He said this, and what he's talking about here, just to set the context, he's talking about getting, um, getting clients. He's talking about getting film directors to hire him, but I think the same thing would be true for you in terms of getting a lawyer and um, their client to agree with you. And the same thing would be true for a copywriter who's trying to get a client to have some confidence in him or her. Uh, here's what Bear McCreary said. He said, the kind of business skills that you need are really social skills. The smartest business move you can make is just being smart socially and politically, understanding how to walk into a room and make everyone feel validated make everyone feel like they've made a good decision in hiring you or they should make a good decision hiring you. These are things that are political skills and social skills, but they're sort of necessary in any business. If you walk around with an ego, if you walk around making people feel like you deserve the job, then that's ultimately a bad business decision because you will just quit getting hired whether or not your work is good. Now, you have to deal, as you've mentioned, both with the lawyer for the executor of the estate and the executor of the state, two very different kinds of people. And by the way, the lawyer is 
have been known to have egos from time to time. And of course, the, the people um, who are dealing with a death, I can say from my own experience and from friends who have gone through this and are going through this, the executor is usually batshit crazy. So you have to come in there and make them feel comfortable comfortable hiring you. What do you think of what Beer McCreary said and, and how does that square with your experience? People skills are, are essential. So the, and, and as, a, as a quick note on that, the only reason I have any associations with uh, people in film is because I live in the, in the greater LA area and I'm involved in charities and I meet these people just because there's, there's a lot of people involved. The, the social skills that are necessary and be a good observer of people and the nature of people, I think is really useful. And I, I took a psychology class in college and I, I really wish that I had paid attention <laughs> because there is some good stuff there. And I think at the time- But, I was but you've learned of, stuff, right? I mean, you've learned stuff yeah. over the years. There are things that maybe you used to do that, you know, sort of um, blew up in your face or hit you in the nose and that you don't do anymore, right? Are, are we talking about my, my time as a, uh, in, in junior high explaining, uh, dealing with explosives? No, we digress. So, I did. Funny, I did the same thing. We'll have to talk about that sometime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, so here, here's, I think this is really essential to know, is that studying the nature of people and not trying to pretend they are otherwise. I have been fascinated how many times in my life I've discovered somebody who might be, as an example, 70 years old, and I would have thought that everybody who, who is, for example, 70, is grown up or has uh, gone beyond certain habits or, or what have you. And that may not be the case. But let me offer this kind of going back. In my business, I have people, you would think the people who come to me are in grief. No, they're not. And the reason I, I say this for a, a potential copywriter is understand really what you're dealing with. So the first thing to know is what I'm doing is that houses don't care, people do. So I may talk on the surface about something having to do with the facts and circumstances, but in truth, what I'm really doing is I'm writing copy that address the personal issues of my target reader and, and how they feel about stuff and what and they're so going how, through. How do they feel? And especially if they're not in grief, what emotions are they really feeling? It's often, it has to do with, uh, with greed, jealousy, uh, competitive family dynamics. Often in, in the experience that I've had is that there was usually, in, in every family, there seems to be a black sheep. Now, in, in my family, I apparently was the black sheep, but I was raised as an only child. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that must have been an interesting family dynamic okay so if there's a black sheep how do you uh, i mean how do you address that just in terms of getting the gig well i have to figure out the the prospect and you know it's a two it's a two-way deal uh because at the end of the day remember i'm actually using my money so i'm perfectly fine with telling somebody uh no they they have to in essence sell me as well so it's not like I'm, it's not like I'm, uh, you know, selling a book or some, you know, piece of merchandise. So in, in dealing with somebody, I needed, I needed to determine who they are. And so I do spend some time listening, but of course, before that, I have to get them to me to be able to have that sales conversation. The purpose of the marketing is to bring them to the salesperson. The job of the salesperson is to influence them in making a decision. So I have to be able to approach them in the sense that the, I, I, want them, I want them to know that I understand them. And something that Chris Voss, you know, Black Swan. Oh, yeah. I love, love this. Difference. Chris is an acquaintance of mine. And, and I've taken his training in addition to his book, strongly suggest that. The, the thing is to use tactical empathy. But you, you can use... You can use terms when you're when you're in your marketing so that people understand 
with these weird fact patterns that, oh yeah, they get me. I want people to find themselves in the story or to believe that I'll understand their story. And this is key, what I'm doing is that they need to understand they're not going to be judged. Okay, boy, what you just said is so universal, works great for copywriters, for business owners, for salespeople, find themselves in the story, understand they're not going to be judged. And uh, uh, Chris Voss's, the book I really like is Never Split the Difference. Um, yeah. That's awesome. You know, we're, we're coming close to the end of our allotted time. So um, there's one more thing I want to talk about because it has played out in your business like I've never heard. Um, you, you've actually taken the concept of lifetime. I mean, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but you took the concept of the lifetime value of a customer and you've taken it past the lifetime of the customer into multi-generational law firms, right? Like father, son, or yeah. father, daughter, or something. Well, I've been doing this a long time, and so because I've mailed to them for so long, that I've marketed to these attorneys and their you, firms. You mail these people a newsletter every month, right? Yes. Jeez. And, and it's pricey, but you know, I'll, let's go through the economics of it is that I work only California. Now there's 240, 260,000 attorneys in California, um, maybe about 200 and, uh, you know, 210,000 more than they need. But the number of attorneys that I mail are, are the ones that I have some kind of an indication that there's something, you know, gonna be there. Okay, so I, in essence, I'm mailing a list, I'm looking at the ROI, and the, in order to mail them, I'm going to say, what is, how much does it, I'm not going to talk in specifics in terms of the money I make, but it may keep, if, if, it, if it costs me a couple hundred dollars to keep one attorney on my list and they call me with the, with the transaction once every five years, even 10 years, it's well worth it. It just seems crazy to be able to keep somebody on that. Now, I have gotten, you know, more than once, I've gotten discouraged and saying, oh, no one's reading this and what have you. I want to feel you know, bad for myself or whatever. Or why do I have all these people on? And then I'll have somebody who will call me and say, yeah, I've been reading your stuff for years. That's how it goes. I'll, oh, my God, they read this shit. And the, the key is, is that they may not call frequently but when they have the situation, they know who to call. You know, they're not going to call bank or whatever. They're, they're going to call an expert. And if you're a business owner, you know, they ought to be calling you because you, you spent all this time. You've invested a relationship in them, even though it's, it's, it's only in your marketing. But they know, like, and trust you because they've seen you in, in print, digitally or, or in, in uh, paper. For, for a long time. I know That's, you don't want to get into the specifics of money, but you did mention um, numbers of zeros um, after an integer um, the other night when we were talking. Could we just say that in the front end, it could be this much, and on the back end, it could be that much in very general terms? Yeah. Yeah, well, so, uh, you know, what What I recognized, uh, and here, here another name dropper is, uh, when I first really got involved in direct response marketing and, and decided to do, you know, most all my own copywriting, I learned that with Jay Abraham. And that was back in the mid nineties. Mm -hmm. And what uh, I never knew about, even though I'm a graduate of a, uh, and, and, and taught at, at a, uh, a very uh, prestigious business school, I never understood about the back end. Maybe it was there, maybe I was drunk, who knows? I wasn't paying attention, but I certainly wasn't uh, uh, employing the, uh, the, the strategy of making money on the back end. So the, uh, uh, I make money in the front end. I make good money on the back end sometimes. And, and your front end could be like, you know, um, four or five figures and your back end could be six figures sometimes, right? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's maybe may, may extremes, but basically they're, they're on, on the front end, I'm making fees for, for uh, transactional fees. And, uh, but but it's, under, it's important to understand 
where you do make your money, where you can make your money, um, because it could be very frustrating. But knowing that, then you can know how much you can afford to spend on your marketing on, on the front end and not be so freaked out if, if you don't get immediate uh, calls. So the, how many lawyers are on your list that you're mailing this newsletter to? Under 10,000. Oh. Under 10,000. Okay. Well, we'll let our, um, our postal aware um, listeners do the math, but that's, that's a lot of money. Okay. I mean, it costs a dollar to mail a letter, which is sort of reasonable. Um, that's a lot of money. And, and what, what got me is that you'll have like children of the original lawyer calling you and that, that when you talk to the lawyer, they say they've been saving everything you sent them for years in files. Now I know lawyers love files, but they also are kind of picky as to what they save if it doesn't have to do with a case they're working on. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't truly understand that. And I don't know that, that I would <laughs> candidly, but what I want somebody to be able to do is, is to find me when they need me. Yeah. And so I'm very, very fussy uh, about how, when people call, how the calls are handled and what have you. As to the uh, multi-generation aspects, yeah, I, I, I want the attorneys to feel, now again, we're, we're talking sales, not so much marketing, but I want everybody to feel very comfortable. And sometimes I'll tell people, hey, what they need to do doesn't involve me at all. I just, I want them to, to my, my job is to take the information, uh, if it's an end user, get over any level of overwhelm and distill it down to identify what the threats, barriers, obstacles are, and get into the opportunity side, really with the, uh, with the attorneys too. Attorneys will suddenly bring you situations that, that they've kind of given up on. Yeah. All right. Well, we have run out of time, but can you give us like the most important thing that, um, one business owner should know about marketing themselves that you see them failing to do that maybe you learned the hard way or you figured it out when you studied with Jay in the nineties or whatever. I, I think you, you really have to have uh, the, the most important thing you can do as a business owner. And, and, and that may be a copywriter who's, you know, doing work for other people. And that is to protect your confidence the most important thing you do. We all go through periods where we're a little discouraged. Right now, th these, are, these are crazy times. Personally, I've been preparing for what we're going through since 2017, not talking about me so much, but if, if you realize that whatever is going on right now, <clears throat> uh, you're gonna look back, there's gonna be a beginning, a middle, and an end. So you could do a lot to protect your confidence by studying, this is the time if you haven't, you know, to really double down on your, on your capabilities, on the craft you do, and to do, you know, whatever uh, training you need to do. Do some testing. You're going to make mistakes. And, and if, you do, if you take little tests, uh, they won't necessarily be big mistakes. You will occasionally make a big mistake. The idea is not make a mistake so big that now you're, you're, you're uh, you know, driving for, uh, Uber Eats. And if you're driving for Uber Eats, Uber Eats not intended to insult you. Okay. I think that's really good advice. It's unique. I totally agree with it. And I, I appreciate that. Rick, thank you for coming on. This has been a great show and a pleasure into a world that uh, <laughs> most of us uh, have no idea about. And, and I think also for people who want to level up with their business, um, some really good tips, probably worth listening to a few times. Nathan, do you want to make any closing comments? Uh, I just want to say thank you, Rick, for coming on. Fascinating episode. And um, until next time, if people want to check out more episodes of the Copywriters Podcast, they can head on over to copywriterspodcast.com. And until then, we will catch you next time. See you next time.